welcome or welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Kaylin. I am a second year PhD student in History and African American Studies at Yale. And today I have a very exciting vlog for you because I am presenting at my first academic conference. This is the first time I'll ever be presenting my work at an academic conference in front of scholars in my field. It's really nerve wracking, but also super exciting. And I have butterflies this morning. I have this wave of imposter syndrome kind of like settling over me and it's gonna be an interesting day but I'm gonna take you guys along because I think that this is something that you guys would benefit from seeing and experiencing along with me but this morning I have an accepted team meeting with the graduate admission team so Danielle, Alani, Chloe's not gonna join for this one but she is also on the grad admissions team now I'm just gonna go ahead and send out the Zoom link and then get started. Oh, great question. That's a good yeah, question. Exactly. Like, that one thing, right? See, my problem is I'm like, if there's a will, there's a way. I will figure it out. And then it comes yeah. down to like me having to figure it out. And I'm like. And then all of a sudden, Kaylin's calling me and she's like, I just detail scrubbed my apartment. I'm like, oh, so we're having mental breakdown. Got it. Like, <laughs> accurate. Say hello. All right, we just had the grad admissions team meeting and we're just now hanging out and I eventually need to put on makeup and start preparing for my conference paper. <laughs> but I've got a very supportive team here helping me deal with my nerves. I'm currently practicing the presentation with Danielle because I need to make sure I have the timing down and even just looking at this paper, like not even presenting it, I feel like I'm gonna puke. <laughs> Oh, I'm so nervous. <sighs> All right, so I practiced my presentation with Danielle and now I am trying to prepare my camera to record the presentation and that way I can include it in this video for you guys. And my other camera is about to die. So I'm gonna be recording on this one. So in the next clip, you'll get to see my 20 minute presentation. You do not need to watch the whole thing. You can scroll to the end if you just wanna hear like the recap and the information about how I actually got into this conference. But I just wanted to share it with you guys because it's something that I wanna keep a hold of personally. I want the video and I wanna be able to reflect on it when I'm an older academic. Um, but I hope you enjoy and you get to learn a little bit about my research. So here you go. Our first speaker today is Kaylin Grace Apple. Kaylin received her BA from UCLA and her Master of Studies from the University of Oxford and is currently a PhD student in History and African American Studies at Yale University, where she is a Nathan Hale Associates Scholar. In her free time, uh, Kaylin runs an academic consulting firm dedicated to providing equitable access to information and supportive resources for community college, non-traditional, and first-generation students seeking to gain acceptance to college or graduate school. So thank you all again for being here, and um, Kaylin, we'll start with you. All right, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. As word reached New York of General Cornwallis's surrender at Yorktown, the nearly 3,000 escaped runaway slaves who had found refuge behind the British lines became increasingly concerned over their fates. While the United States de delegates dispatched to London to negotiate the terms of the Treaty of Paris, British officers such as Sir Guy Carleton began to make arrangements for the removal of their troops and the many families who had proven their loyalty to Great Britain throughout the American Revolution. The humid summer days leading up to the evacuation of New York to Nova Scotia in 1783 must have been a torment for those who had fled from their masters several years prior. However, Carleton sought to uphold the freedom promised to them by Lord Dunmore, who had fled to the enemy, um, who had fled to, quote, his majesty's army, requiring provisions be made for their removal to Nova Scotia as well. In his attempt to authenticate their status and follow the instructions provided by the resolution of the Treaty of Paris, Carleton ordered that an evacuation registry be recorded in thorough detail. The registry Carleton requested was later titled the Book of Negroes, and within it contained the names of 2,744 escaped slaves and freed blacks who had joined the British Army between 1775 and 1781. In July, Carleton ordered an English ship known as the Abundance to embark on her journey to Birchtown, Nova Scotia, carrying with her a cargo of 
numerously of numerous newly freed black individuals, many of them traveling with family. Among the abundance of many passengers was Esther Herbert, who after having been born in New York was only, only three weeks prior, was the youngest evacuee aboard. Esther's mother, Rachel Herbert, had fled from the estate of Mills Wilkinson in 1779. Fleeing from the coastal county of Nansen in the same year that the British set the city of Portsmouth aflame, Rachel accounts for one of the 229 enslaved people from Virginia who chose to join the British Army that same year and who were later listed in the evacuation record. Among the passengers who traveled alongside Rachel and her infant daughter were the numerous families who had been reunited during their journeys to join the British. Even Rachel, like many others, fled from her master's estate with a family member. Having traveled and survived until the end of the war with her mother, Hester Wilkinson, by her side, Rachel is surrounded by her loved ones as she prepared for and likely began imagining what her life would become upon docking in Nova Scotia. Rachel Herbert's story, profi and story and profile comes to life when one closely examines the fine details embedded within the individual listings in the Book of Negroes. Unlike most evacuation documents which indicate the movement of African people throughout the Atlantic world, namely records pertaining to the slave trade, this record stand out, stands out due to the detailing of names, ages, former counties of origin, and even short descriptions of their appearances. While historians such as Benjamin Quarles, Maya Jasanoff, and Cassandra Pibus have turned to the registry for individual listings and broad quantitative assessments, a thorough consolidation of the listings in a self-constructed database seeks to demonstrate the importance of family groups, the timing of one's departure, and county origins. Fled to the Enemy seeks to demonstrate how the application of quantitative methods to the study of eva this evacuation record allows individual and collective stories, as well as patterns of migration, to emerge. While the initial article I set out to write was designed to engage with Cassandra Pibus's groundbreaking quantitative study presented in her article, Jefferson's Faulty Math, I soon discovered while compiling my own database on runaways from Virginia that my methods and finding were, findings were more closely aligned with her later work Epic Journeys, in Epic Journeys of Freedom. In addition to illustrating the profile of the average runaway and their patterns of communal or, fr or, group, or family group movement, this essay seeks to tell a regional story of how the revolution led to three distinct categories of runaways from Virginia. While the southern coastal plain of Virginia was, is the most widely represented in the Book of Negroes and the primary region from which enslaved people absconded from their masters to join the British, it is also the region which had the most disruption throughout the entirety of the war. The northern Tidewater region, however, experienced several various coastal plantation raids with a notable attack on General George Washington's Mount Vernon, with slaves being taken aboard the HMS Savage. Those enslaved on the coastal plantations along the Chesapeake likely sought to join the British along the coast and board ships bound for New York, rather than seeking out land-based encampments. The third region was that of the Piedmont or Virginia's interior, which has claimed limited scholarly attention, but whose slaves traveled significant distances and over challenging terrains to secure their freedom, or who were unfortunate, were unfortunate enough to wind up with General Cornwallis at Yorktown. In the end, slaves appeared to have developed strategies for travel, which allowed many to reunite with families and for some even begin new families across British lines. By taking a mixed methods approach driven by quantitative assessments drawn out of a self-compiled database, I seek to contextualize the lives of those listed in the registry and provide further knowledge regarding those who fled to the enemy. So, who fled? As Jonas Bracey petitioned to join the voyage from Nova Scotia to Sierra Leone with his two young children, it is possible he may have reflected upon his initial journey from New York and before that, Virginia. After having spent the majority of his adolescence laboring for, Joan for Thomas Bracey in Norfolk, Virginia, Jonas sought to seize an opportunity and secure his freedom by joining the British Army. Joined by three others, a man and two children, Jonas likely caught word that the British were nearby from the widespread communication networks, which connected enslaved men and women across the colony. According to various entries in the evacuation record, it is evident that enslaved people from the same county, or even the same master, fled at different times and likely sent word back to their friends and family when it was clear that the British had held up their offer of protection up until that point at least. 
Jonas Bracey was one of the thousands of enslaved persons who fled to the British and one of the few who was able to claim his freedom at the end of the American Revolution. Jonas's travel companions, on the other hand, were not so lucky. Though Jonas was listed in the Book of Negroes and later in the Birchtown Muster in Nova Scotia, the man and two children who were said to have run away with him were not. It is possible that they died due to smallpox, which seized many of the lives, many a life throughout the period of the Revolution, especially in the tight living quarters such as those across British lines. In addition to having come from Norfolk, Jonas was also said to have been 23 at the time of his departure making him a statistical example of the average runaway who joined the British and who was later listed in the evacuation registry. According to a general analysis of the average age, sex, county of origin, and year of departure, Jonas Bracey is representative of a model runaway from Virginia. Though Lord Dunmore's proclamation in 1775 had specifically called for the service of able-bodied male slaves and, service and servants appertaining to rebels, Dunmore failed to predict how many women would also seek to join the British. While male runaways make up 52% of those listed in the evacuation registry from Virginia, female runaways make up a significant 43%, with the remaining 5% being absent from the record. Regardless of its initial intent, the British offer of freedom signaled to nearby slaves that fleeing to the British was, perhaps, the only option which granted them their freedom, that which might grant them their freedom. In addition to the list of runaway slaves, however, there exists a small number of, quote, freeborn persons who were listed in the registry as well. Making up 5% of the total runaways from Virginia, free blacks may have joined the British for fear that their status was precarious and that the British were more likely than the patriots to secure their ongoing autonomy. One additional possibility worth considering is that of family and community. Though one may have been born free or been manumitted, it is still possible that they maintained relationships or family ties to those enslaved in Virginia. One such example is that of Patty and William Johnson. Unlike Patty, who was said to have been free-born in Portsmouth, William Johnson was said to have been born a slave and labored for John Chapman in Princess Anne County until the time of his departure to the British in 1779. Their relationship is assumed due to their common surname and having been listed together in the Birchtown Muster in 1784. Though one cannot assume their what their relationship may have been before joining the British or if they met across British lines, such connections incorporate further nuance to this study. While the majority of those listed were in their 20s, there are some notable outliers. Among these statistical anomalies are Phyllis Scott, age 69, and Abigail Godfrey, age 71, along with little three-week-old Esther Herbert. Though historians have suggested that slaves may have remained in bondage for fear of leaving their elderly family members behind, the data reveals that over 50 individuals over the age of 50 were successfully able to cross British lines and secure their passage to Nova Scotia. An additional outlier is the presence of 92 children who were said to have been, quote, born within British lines, including Esther Herbert, making up a total of 9% of the total number of total number listed in the Virginia database. The remarkable number of children born to newly free women, newly freed women within the British camps has received little scholarly attention. When George Talbot fled from the estate of Solomon Talbot in 1778, he left behind his partner Susanna and their son James. After having been separated for an unknowable amount of time, the Talbot family was finally reunited a year later in 1779 and would remain so throughout the as they began their new lives in Birchtown. Of the over 900 runaways listed in the Book of Negroes from Virginia, 42% were said to have traveled or been reunited with a family member. While a majority of the 154 family groups originated from the same estates or counties and are said to have fled as a unit, there are some notable exceptions. Eight of the families listed are said to have had an individual who joined the British a year or two before the rest of their family group. Such patterns demonstrate the importance of widespread communication networks among the enslaved and free black communities, as well as the strategy required to reconnect family members who had been separated due to trades among slave owners. While the first map here is from 1857, it is the oldest I could find within the digital copies available within the Library of Congress. I it was used as a rough outline for the following map, which I created to indicate the three primary regions I will discuss in this paper. 
broken into three regional categories, the Northern Tidewater, the Southern Coastal Plain, and the Piedmont, or more broadly for the Virginia interior. This map represents the varying patterns of runaway movement, which were largely dependent on geography and the location of the British Army at any given time. The northern and southern regions are separated by the York River for the purpose of the study in order to account for the varying experiences which will be discussed throughout this presentation. While entering each individual into the database, it became evident that a majority of those who fled did so from the southern coast. While the overall distribution of the British Army's southern campaign in Virginia has been acknowledged by historians at length, what has garnered little attention is the importance of these regional differences to the lives of runaways. By following the stories of three, run of these, of three runaways listed in the Book of Negroes, I seek to highlight how the lived experience of the war differed depending on which county one originated from. Harry Washington, after having worked in the Dismal Swamp under the direction of his master general George Washington, was transferred to Mount Vernon in 1766. Less than 10 years later, he fled. Just after hearing word of Lord Dunmore's proclamation, Harry Washington joined the hundreds of enslaved men and women who sought to join Dunmore in the early years of the war. Though many fled in the early years, died to the battle, died in battle or due to smallpox exposure, there are a spare few, including Harry, who were, who were fortunate enough to remain with Dunmore when he embarked north to New, to New York in August of 1776. Along with the 13% of those who were explicitly stated to have joined Dunmore, 50% of those listed from the Northern Tidewater region joined the British between 1775 and 1776. The other half, however, however, joined at the very end of the war. In a letter to his cousin, Lund, Watch Lund Washington wrote that the HMS Savage, a British naval ship, had set anchor near Mount Vernon and took with him took with them 17 slaves in 1781. One of those slaves mentioned was Deborah Squash, those who, who was later listed with her husband, Harry Squash, in the evacuation record. Based on these patterns of movement, with the majority fleeing in the first two and the final year of the war, I argue that Tidewater, that Tidewater runaways most likely joined the British naval fleet or fled with Dunmore. Another example to further this argument is the representation of runaways from Nan from Northampton and Accomac County, which were disconnected from the British Army by the Chesapeake, but would have been near enough to naval ships docked in the harbor to make their escape. James and Tessa Connor fled from one of the largest fled with one of the largest collective family groups listed in the evacuation record. Originating from Norfolk and the Isle of Wight, James and Tessa fled in 1779 alongside their daughter, James's two siblings, and James's father. Though the southern coast accounts for over 70% of those listed in the Book of Negroes, what is even more intriguing is that the majority fled in the year 1779. The question which naturally then arose, which was why this year in particular? One such answer may be that in May 1779, a British fleet led by Admiral Collier a regiment, and a regiment led by General Matthew seized the city of Portsmouth, destroying stores of tobacco housed in warehouses throughout Suffolk County. Hoping to cripple Virginia's tobacco-dependent economy, the British not only burned Virginia planters' most profitable crop, but according to the Black Loyalist database, also took with them a group of runaways which consisted of 256 men, 135 women, and 127 children. Slaves who fled from Norfolk County alone, from Norfolk County alone account for 29% of the overall runaways listed from Virginia. Slaves listed from the three primary counties in the southern coastal plain, Suffolk, Nansemond, and Norfolk, alone account for nearly half of the total number of slaves listed in the database. While most fled by foot, many also sought to board British ships and were therefore even more likely to find themselves in New York at the conclusion of the war. Additionally, the majority of family groups consisting of over, consisted of over four family members and were said to have fled from the southern coastal region. Therefore, I argue that those runaways who fled from the southern coastal region were more likely to success, successfully, successfully join the British and to reunite or flee alongside their family members. In 1779, Bill Williams fled from the estate of William Cousins in Amelia County to join the British. Unlike the other runaways listed in the, from Virginia in the Book of Negroes, however, Will, Bill Williams fled from the location and at a time when the British were stationed nearly 100 miles away. Though most runaways traveled distances of nearly 30 miles,
Bill's journey and county of departure appears odd when compared to the runaways I mentioned from the southern coast. While slaves from Virginia's interior were the least likely to, fly, to flee to the British due to the challenging landscape and the location of the British army, there were some notable exceptions in the book worth further consideration. Though tens of miles from the British camps and naval ships, slaves from Rappahannock and Amelia County were successfully listed in the evacuation record as newly freed runaways. But how? Rappahannock, located in the northern Piedmont, and Amelia, located in the south, have one notable similarity, a nearby river which had access to the eastern shore. Both the Rappahannock and Appomattox rivers were accessible within a few miles by foot and would have granted runaways the opportunity to cover tens of the remaining miles by water. Furthermore, there is a peak in the number of slaves from the Piedmont in 1778 and 1779, suggesting that major events such as the burning of Portsmouth may have signaled may have provided a signal to slaves even hundreds of miles away that the British had the upper hand and would provide the most likely opportunity for freedom. While those listed from the interior were the most likely to have traveled with or remained attached to their companions or family members, their appearance in the record demonstrates their persistent ingenuity and strong desire for freedom. In the end, this is not a paper about the total liberation of slaves and the patronage of the British, but a story about how enslaved men and women strategically chose to join the British as a means of improving their circumstances and to reunite with their loved ones. By implementing methods of quantitative analysis in order to support my study of those listed in the Book of Negroes from Virginia, I've sought to indicate the importance of time, space, and family ties to further studies of runaways during the American Revolution. Slaves and freeborn Black people used the British offer of freedom to strategically reunite with their families and communities and navigate varying landscapes, including major waterways, in, in order to access the British lines. Furthermore, I urge historians and myself to continue investigating the Book of Negroes and to possibly apply this framework to all 13 colonies in future studies of the Revolution. County and regional origins therefore play an even greater role in one's understanding of how enslaved men and women experienced and navigated the wartime landscape, leading one to consider those who successfully or unsuccessfully risked their lives to flee to the enemy. Congratulations, Kaylin. That was her first conference paper, everyone. Bravo. Good job. <laughs> A milestone, major milestone. All right, friends, I hope that you enjoyed that little sneak peek into my research. And thank you so much for sticking around if you watch through all 20 minutes of that. So I just quickly want to talk a little bit about my experience today with my first conference. And then I also want to talk about the process of applying for conferences, preparing for conferences, how to write the conference papers, all of those things, because I get questions about it a lot. And now that I finally got through the process myself, I just want to share with you a little bit of my experience. So I'll start with talking a little bit about today. I was the first person to present and I was really nervous about it, but everybody was so supportive and I actually am really happy with how my presentation went. In history conferences, we typically just read from our paper. In the humanities, it's really difficult to present your work, in my opinion, without reading from your article. The reason being that you're not just presenting data and talking about how it, you found it, you're talking about sources, places, people, the historiography and the theories that kind of go into your work and your methods. I, I just think it's really hard to remember everything. If you were to ask me all of the things that I stated in my statement today, talking about all of the people, talking about the statistics, talking about my findings, I could tell you the broad scope of the project but I would have a really difficult time actually conveying my arguments and everything very clearly, in which case it was really nice to just be able to read off the page. When I was a kid, I had such a fright of public speaking, and I still do, but back then I would stammer over my words, and I could tell that that was kind of coming up today. I had a couple words that I kind of tripped over, and had to go back. I also have difficulty reading while I'm speaking and find that things kind of get jumbled. So I definitely could tell that I was nervous, but I'm glad that I went first because I didn't have the time to let the anxiety build 
For me, my experience with public speaking is that my heart starts to race. Like it feels like it's pumping out of my chest. And so today I'm actually really happy that I did not have enough time to get that anxious. Also, I practiced the conference paper multiple times. I practiced it in front of my advisor. I practiced it with Danielle this morning and that definitely helped my nerves. And also this is a project I've been working on for a while, so I felt really comfortable with it. However, the thing that I was the most concerned about was the Q&A. Some academics are really kind and really generous. Others really like to tear the work of others apart. And I was just really concerned about the type of feedback I'd be getting. This is very early in my career, obviously. I'm only a second year PhD student. This is my first time presenting at a conference. It was my first time presenting on Zoom at a conference. And so I was so nervous about how it was gonna be perceived. And I think that's where the anxiety came from. It wasn't about messing up my words or stammering. It was more about the concern of the feedback. But what I really appreciated was that the convener actually provided a lot of feedback and I took some notes during her talk and some things that I can work on. And that is what is so valuable about conferences and working groups and ways that you can actually workshop your work because they brought up things that I hadn't even thought about, some terminology I hadn't even considered. That's what I think is so important about community and camaraderie within the academic field. And I think that's also what has been lost for me, at least this last year and a half of being online, especially when you're developing research, which combines all of these methods and theories and thoughts and all of this literature, it's so hard to know what you're missing and what your blind spots are. And your advisor covers some of those, your colleagues cover the others, and then you also really lean on the academic community at large to help you think about these questions. And that was one thing I was really missing, being online, and I feel emotional about it because Today was the first time in a long time that I got to present my work and I felt so gratified getting to hear this feedback of like, try this or consider that or look at this work by this person and to be able to workshop my ideas, to know that the work actually matters to people and that they're willing to provide this feedback is just so heartwarming, truly. Also, I just, I really, <laughs> I really love the history community and the academic community and the type of support it lends. Being an early career academic, I woke up this morning feeling so much imposter syndrome, feeling so out of place and like I don't deserve to be doing this, I'm not smart enough, my work isn't good enough and it was so nice to have such positive feedback and such constructive feedback. And I think that was what was really important about my experience today. I wrote those things down. I have so many ideas on things I wanna change about my article now. And I was feeling so stuck with it. I, I had ideas of where I wanted to go, but I just, there was something, there was a layer that was missing. And I think that today I finally discovered what was missing. And it is this component about migration. Also the language of using the term runaway versus freedom seeking, and also making comparisons to other wartime runaway movements such as the War of 1812 or the Civil War. And there were other suggestions of kind of looking into 19th century literature, which I'm gonna dig into a little bit. And I just feel so inspired and excited. And so that was really important to my experience. But I also wanted to cover the actual applying process and how I prepared. I know many of you are in a similar position to me and I just wanted to give this as an example for you of my first experience going through it and talk a little bit about how I got here. So in the field of history, it is common to apply to conferences as a panel. So the way that panels are constructed, it's typically three scholars and a convener and the convener or the commenter is the one who will read all the papers and provide the like 10 minute comment and they will also present all of the speakers. And the three panelists are typically colleagues that have met previously. They've thought about this 
subject for a while. And each conference has its own theme. So the AHA, so the American Historical Association, hosts their annual conference, in which case you need to be doing work on American history very broadly, but you want to think about working with people kind of within either your geographic region, your time period, your kind of thematic region. And so you want to pair yourself with others in the field that are doing similar work. The way this is done is by networking and, and making connections within your university and beyond. I also have heard of many panels coming together because of academic Twitter. So you can say, I have this paper that I'm looking to submit for X conference. I'm looking for people that are doing similar work. Always remember to use hashtags like hashtag Twitter historians, hashtag sheer 2021, hashtag academic Twitter, etc. So that way you can like really get it out into the Twitter sphere and see who can come back to you. Another way that you can apply to conferences is as an individual. You are far less likely to be accepted for the conference if you apply as an individual for a conference that is mostly made up of panels. But this is what I did. I didn't know anybody that was really doing work on loyalism or runaways, migration. And so I just applied on a whim. This was a project that I worked on in undergrad and now working on turning it into an article and I wanted to present it. And so I applied back in December of 2019, like the day before the deadline. And it was accepted last year, COVID happened. So the, the conference was pushed to this year. And so it was accepted so that I could present it this particular sheer conference. Other conferences and other fields specifically in STEM also do the posters and other uh, types of presentations. This is less common in history and the humanities, but that's another way to kind of submit your work. But what you submit is your abstract. So generally it's about 500 to 1000 words, depending on the conference and what they're asking for on your research. So it's basically the proposal or the abstract of the work that you're doing. If your paper is then accepted, you'll usually hear back in a couple months. Every conference has their own timeline. So check the standard in your own industry. But for us, it's about three to six months, you'll hear back and with that, once you hear back, you need to get working on writing the conference paper. Conference papers tend to be anywhere from 10 to about 15 pages, depending on the length of the presentation. So it's standard in history presentations for it to be about 20 minutes. So my paper today was, I believe, 13 total pages, double spaced. Well, point font. Everybody is slightly different. Everybody talks at different paces. I was trying so, so hard to speak slowly and clearly again so I could avoid stammering. I haven't had as much of an issue with it again as an adult, but every once in a while when I'm really nervous, I will just kind of mash my words together and then I get really flustered. So I try to speak very slowly. I try to make sure that my papers are no more than about 13 pages. About 12 to 13 is generally where I try to stick to for a 20 minute presentation. And this will vary, but regardless, that's kind of the standard for what we submit. You'll send that paper on to the convener and the convener will then read the papers in preparation for the presentation. And then in terms of what I did to prepare for the presentation, everybody has their own way of doing it. I personally just need to read the paper aloud to someone or to a mirror. And I really like reading to someone so that way I can kind of see facial expressions and those reactions. So I practiced it on my own. I practiced it in front of my advisor in a class and I also practiced it in front of Danielle today. And I also timed myself each time that I did the presentation. So that way I could make sure that it was gonna be within the limit. I originally, when I wrote the paper, it was actually about a minute and a half below the 20 minute cutoff. And so I actually added an additional paragraph. It's much easier to set up a conference paper based on something you've previously written. So I have the general draft of my article put together. And what I did was basically take the, the bones of that article, the structure and take the bits and pieces that I think were the most important 
in a conference, you are never going to be able to cover absolutely everything that's going to be in an article because you just don't have enough time. So you need to pick out the most relevant information. Some conferences allow you to actually have a PowerPoint presentation, some don't. I used a PowerPoint presentation today, in which case I made sure that I had visual cues, but there wasn't a whole lot of information on the slides. It was really just to kind of provide context. I was talking about regional differences, as you saw, and I should have included the presentation slides in the in the clip. And as you saw, when I talk about regional differences, I wanted to kind of show the map of how I was breaking that up. I thought there was going to be a lot more questions about how I made that decision to break up the map of Virginia. I'm honestly a little surprised that it didn't come up. And then I gave the presentation. I had prepared for it. I gave it today. And then afterward, after all the presentations, there was a Q&A. I actually got the most questions of anybody on the panel today for my research. And there were a couple questions I was expecting and there were others that I was not. One question in particular was how does violence and insurrection actually play into your research? And I had thought about it a little bit, but I hadn't really considered it as a prominent role within the research that I was doing because I was looking more at the act of fleeing rather than looking at insurrection and then abandon. So it wasn't something I had considered entirely, in which case the answer that I gave I don't quite believe was sufficient, but that is something that I put down in my notes and I'm gonna consider. Another thing with conferences is to remain in touch with anybody that asked questions that you really enjoyed or that you thought were important or that may have resources for you. There were many people on academic Twitter today that provided resources and I'm gonna send out some emails so that way I can get in touch with them and hopefully set up some meetings. The academic world, just like any of their industries, all about networking, conferences are so important, not only for you to present your work and to start getting some feedback, but also to network, especially if you wanna remain on the academic job market. So. These are all things to take into consideration. And I know this video was very lengthy, but I really hope that you got some good information out of it. I'm gonna to try to put timestamps in the bottom so that way people can refer back to this video as they're going through this process themselves. Thank you so much for watching and for all of your support. I received such wonderful messages today and I really appreciate it. So thank you all so much for being here, for subscribing to my YouTube channel and for following along this crazy, crazy journey of mine. And I am just so happy that I get to share it with you all. So remember to give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it, hit the subscribe button if you are yet to subscribe, and I will see you all in the next video. Thank you all for watching. See you next time. Bye.